You're listening to Conflict Radio on the Conflict Radio Network. Greetings, and welcome to Conflict Radio. Today is July 28th, 2020, and we've got an interesting show lined up today. We are going to have two guests. We're going to have Jared Murphy on. He's the author of It's Not Aliens, Worse, It's Us. And we're also going to have Michael Cremo on. Michael Cremo is the author of several books, including My Science, My Religion, The Forbidden Archaeologist, Human Devolution, Forbidden Archaeology, and The Hidden History of the Human Race. He can be found at M. Cremo, that's M C R E M O dot com. And you can go there, you can order his books, you can look through his website, you can look through his lectures and papers and interviews and the Museum of Forbidden Archaeology, Mysterious Origins of Man, all kinds of neat things on his website there. I recommend going over and taking a look. He's a very interesting man. I don't know how this interview is going to go. I'm having two guests on. I think I'm just going to sit back and, and let them go at it. They actually write a lot in common with each other, so I think they're going to get along pretty well, and it ought to be a really good interview. So let's just get right to it. We'll be back with Jared Murphy and Michael Cremo right after this. Welcome back to Conflict Radio. We are with Michael Cremo, and joining us special is Jared Murphy. Both of them have wrote extensively in Forbidden Archaeology and Past Civilizations. Are you guys there? How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing fine, uh, Michael. Another another Michael. We'll have to keep it straight, <laughs> which Michael we're talking about. And good to be with you, Jared. Good to be with you also. All right. So, so Forbidden Archaeology is quite a popular book, is it not? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's become kind of like a generic name, like, Kleenex or something or Xerox, you know, became, they were specific products, but they became names for a more generic topic. So it's the same with my book, Forbidden Archaeology. It was the specific title I gave to that book, but uh, it's become a topic, a general topic. There are forbidden archaeology websites and conferences and all kinds of things so it's kind of interesting to see how the term kind of caught on yeah definitely uh, definitely has taken on a, a life of its own really in, in its own sense now i do like to bring up interesting uh, interesting recent news whenever we have jared on and jared you have some recent discoveries for us don't you yeah and it ties, I think, right into Michael's book, especially. It was a question I was going to have for you anyway, Michael. It's so great to speak with you in person since you were such a foundational part of me writing. And that 20,000-year estimate that they've now placed, uh, the recent news that uh, America was probably populated 20,000 years earlier than thought. I feel like that ties into something you've talked about for a long time, and I wanted to ask you about knowledge filtration, and specifically, we have this example of Waylaco and Virginia Steam McIntyre, and I wanted to ask you, uh, based on younger archaeologists or the people that you've made such impressions on through all of your worldwide work and lecturing, do you feel that this is just a continuation of the house of cards falling or do you feel like maybe there's something else besides this recent announcement of this 20,000 year old find that um, way Laco already represents in Mexico a 260 to 500,000 plus year find. Do you, do you see any movement on that? Uh, I see some tiny steps going in the right direction for mainstream archaeology. Like, like you've mentioned, the, the mainstream archaeological consensus is that there are no human beings anywhere in the world any earlier than 
you know, about 250,000 or 300,000 years ago. And as far as North America is concerned, you know, they would say about 20,000 years. But in recent years, there have been some discoveries. You mentioned this most recent one. I think it occurred in Mexico, right? Yeah. Uh, and it kind of the, the uh, discoverers, the archaeologists working at that particular site have pushed the age back to maybe uh, 40 or 50,000 years, if I'm not mistaken. And you know that that's that's a step in the right direction, but there we're not even taking into account a report that came out last year or within the last year or two from the San Diego area in California, where paleontologists and archaeologists found evidence for a human presence that they said in their published uh, report goes back over a hundred thousand years. So I'm kind of surprised that uh, archaeologists, they, they tend to forget what's already been pretty much established in, in their own discipline. So, you know, that's, that brings up that whole topic of knowledge filtration, you know, that there's just dozens of discoveries, say like in North America, if we're talking about that part of the world, there are just dozens of discoveries that have been made over the past century or so that show human beings been present for millions of years. Uh, but, you know, they're kind of filtered out. Archaeologists forget them, set them aside, ignore them, dismiss them on on pretty flimsy grounds and things like that. You know, you, you know there's the Calico site in Southern California, which was explored by Lewis Leakey. There, there was evidence for a human presence in the form of stone tools and weapons that go back about 300,000 years. And there's even more, which we can go into. Well, and I, on the East Coast, I know you mentioned it in Forbidden Archaeology that you have campsites and uh, Virginia Steen McIntyre made such an impact, that story that you told, and uh, of course what actually happened to her after that fine for Waylaco. But um, the gentleman from Canada that made the same discoveries that got routed out, can you talk a little bit about him? Yeah, well, there were some discoveries that were made in Canada in the, the, the 1960s. And, you know, there was an archaeologist there, and he, he was working at a site on Manitoulin Island, which is an island in the Great Lakes. And, you know, he was finding evidence for a human presence there that went back to the last interglacial period. So, you know, that's about roughly 100,000 years ago. So he, he, he tried to get some reports published about, about this. Um, now, his name was uh, Lee. You know, it was Dr. Lee, Robert Lee. And he, uh, <clears throat> he, he found that when he, he tried to get these things known, that, you know, the, the artifacts he had collected were confiscated and gotten rid of. The site was closed down and bulldozed over and, and made into, a, you know, a recreational area. And his own reputation was just destroyed and 
you know, you know, he and he was pointing these things out very, very directly. And yeah, you know, that's one way in which this knowledge filtering process can operate. Yeah, you know, they just uh, destroy the reputations of the scientists involved in these discoveries, like Dr. Lee, for example. Now, now, why, why the suppression? Why do they do that so much? Uh, in one sense, you could say it's human nature. You know, for example, if I love somebody and somebody tells me something bad about the person I love, then I may be become yeah you know, find it very hard to accept. I may become a little angry at the person who tells me these things. And you know, so scientists are very much in love with their theories, with their their contributions to those theories. And when they hear something that goes against uh, a theory that is very well established and as you say, why do people even get involved in these things? It's it's because they love what they're doing. They love what they're, you know. So if you contradict, you know, something like that, then you get some negative feedback, and it may go even deeper than that. That uh, <clears throat> there's power issues involved. And there are different kinds of power, military power, political power, economic power. There's also intellectual power. power, Intellectual power, which is a very subtle power, but a very real one. And we see that those who have monopoly power especially, you know, they don't like to give it up. If one political party has a monopoly in the political a uh, political life of a country or state or city or county doesn't want to give up its position. If a certain company has a monopoly and a certain sector of the economy doesn't want to give up its position, you know, if a certain group of scientists has a monopoly in the education system, scientific institutions doesn't want to give up its position. So it's something that's gone on since the world has has begun and you know it, it would be nice you know say i'm an alternative kind of researcher it would be nice to be living in a time when the when the ideas that i hold were the mainstream ideas uh, th- that would be very nice but sometimes you know researchers find themselves in a position where what they are convinced of as being the truth about a, a matter, whether it's the archaeology of North America or the origin of the human species or theories about the origin of the universe or the origin of life. You know, they, they may be existing in a time when their ideas that they are deeply convinced about are not in the mainstream or the dominant ideas and then you have to decide what to do do you feel like the uh, still that there's an added filter between the east and the west that constantly the anything eastern in a western hemisphere is considered secondary or just well you know something happened in china and something happened in india but we all know everything started in greece uh that kind of thing exists. That's another area of possible bias or knowledge filtration. But I think the the deeper the deeper issue lies with consciousness. Is everything is everything about our existence explainable? by ordinary matter combining in different ways, or do we have to expand our ontology to include something like consciousness as something that can exist separately from matter? I think that's where the big divide takes place, not so much in terms of Eastern and Western geographically, but you, you might say many of the Eastern wisdom traditions are more favorable to the idea that 
uh, consciousness is something that can exist independently from matter. And I think that's ultimately where all this forbidden archaeology leads. You know, what, who are we? Where did we come from? I'd say ultimately we're beings of pure consciousness, and that's what we are. And do you think I, – I was very impressed with Forbidden Archaeology even touching on the Rockefeller Foundation, and you went way into that about the nature of the mind-brain-body relationship. So I guess speaking to that consciousness, I guess my question would be on – from the time that you noticed what the Rockefeller Foundation was doing, and I know a lot of people like to talk off into the con- uh, uh, legitimate, uh, great, maybe we can call it gray state or, or that direction, but when it comes to the research that you noticed already when you wrote f- when you wrote Forbidden Archaeology and what the Rockefeller Foundation was doing on the nature of that mind-body relationship, where do you think it's really progressed to now? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting development. Um, John D. Rockefeller, you know, the founder of the, of the dynasty, John D. Rockefeller Sr., uh, who founded Standard Oil and made billions of dollars and set up the first Rockefeller Foundations and Charities, he was a pretty strict Baptist. And, you know, he, he was originally into funding uh, Baptist missionary work in China and Africa and uh, Baptist institutions of learning and hospitals and things of that sort. But uh, the succeeding generations like John D. Rockefeller Jr. in the early 20th century kind of stepped away from the the Baptist sort of uh, inclinations of the founder and became more interested in modern science. And they became apostles of the Darwinian theory of evolution and they were very interested in expanding a materialistic conception of science in the United States and around the world so they began funding research that backed that up <clears throat> and part of that you know how I got into the Rockefeller Foundation is when I was looking into the case of some fossil discoveries that were made in China in the 1920s, the so-called Beijing Man or Peking Man, as it was called then, uh, discoveries, which were thought to be some kind of missing link between ancient apes and modern humans. In other words, they were supporting the Darwinian theory of evolution, which was... Uh, based on the materialistic idea that we're just machines made of matter in competition with each other for survival. And we've come about by a purely materialistic process of evolution. So there was a, a, a scientist working at the Beijing Medical College, which the Rockefeller foundation had set up in China as a way of introducing Western materialistic scientific ideas into that country so they could establish uh, control over it. You know, they were selling, you know, you've heard the phrase oil for the lamps of China. Well, Standard Oil was selling lots of kerosene and oil to China at that time. So this was kind of part of that whole effort. So they funded the research of uh, a scientist who was doing excavations at Shukutin in uh, near Beijing in China. You know, this uh, uh, Dr. Black from China, from Canada, excuse me. He was working at this Beijing Medical 
University that the Rockefeller Foundation had set up, and he was finding evidence for some kind of missing link they called Beijing Man. And the Rockefeller Foundation was funding it to the hilt. And at the same time, they were also funding all kinds of other research. They were funding uh, the introduction of Freudian psychology into American universities and all kinds of different things things related to astronomy and biology and sociology and psychology. And the director of the uh, foundation at that time said, it, it may seem that we're doing this in kind of like a shotgun fashion, you know, doing research on physics and research on chemistry and astronomy and archaeology. But he says it's actually all one program. We're trying to understand human nature with the idea of establishing what he called beneficial control. Control by whom? For what purpose? Yeah. You know, so, do you, do you think that our con- our understanding of consciousness has been deliberately altered? Uh, I think there's been a concerted attempt in the scientific and educational institutions around the world to get people to see consciousness as something that is a temporary byproduct of bioelectrical activity in the brain. In other words, it's produced by chemicals in the brain. And at the time of death, when the chemicals stop interacting in the brain, then there's no more consciousness, no more mind or intelligence or anything like that. In other words, We're just machines made of molecules. We're machines made of matter in competition with each other for survival. Therefore, our goals should simply be to produce and consume more and more material things. And a whole set of political, financial, cultural, even religious organizations and institutions have been set up based on this principle of having everybody in the world just be good producers and consumers of material things. That's your purpose. And by doing that, we generate huge amounts of wealth which flow into certain pockets for their benefit and we get the crumbs that are left over. Uh, Just be good producers and consumers of material things. And and the purpose of the way that's accomplished is by convincing people you're just a machine made of molecules. Then you, you, you can control them. Practically, you know, it's if, if there were a different idea that, well, no, we're not machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival. We're all beings of pure consciousness. I'm a being of pure consciousness. You're a being of pure consciousness. We're all beings of pure consciousness. Let's satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, and efficient and fair and equitable way possible while putting most of our human energy into developing that resource of consciousness, it would be an entirely different set of political, financial, economic, cultural organizations and institutions that we would have. It would be a completely different, we wouldn't be dividing ourselves up into so many competing groups uh, we wouldn't be destroying the environment you know, by unsustainable means of uh, exploiting you know, the resources of nature. It, it would be a completely 
different worldwide civilizations. Michael, I got a question for you on that. I, when I was writing and looking at all the megalithic ruins and all of our past and the the levels of of technology right down to the soil, one of the things that when I was looking at when when you speak specifically about the Hindu scriptures and the potential of us being here, well, the reality of us being here for millions of years, one of the things I noticed was this innate human that we've established ability of synesthesia and the idea that, well, we're only 10 to 14 percent conscious now, but I was looking at the level of technology in our ancient past, and one of the things I wrote about was synesthesia is abilities that allow us to either smell or experience colors or sound or feel somebody else's touch or anything else that doesn't, although they're crediting us with having, oh, 22% of the population has this ability, if we were more conscious in the past and we were more connected, is there more of a chance in that they've, uh, they've already written about uh, you know, Harvard scientists were saving information on genes in DNA. We were able to hold terabytes of information. D- have you in your recent research or writing d- thought about that specific point that it's not just mechanics because we keep looking at this departmentalized view of each. We're not just a series of computer functions. When you take it in its whole and you can see or touch or feel beyond one single human, isn't it, I mean, isn't the math and the science just observationally in these different abilities, like synesthesia, an indicator to a more advanced connection as, a, as, as humans? Yeah, I, I do tend to think that. Actually, even on the individual level, it's very difficult. It's been impossible for psychologists and cognitive and neuroscientists to explain uh, what they would call the binding problem. Yeah, because their idea is that everything we experience in terms of sensations, emotions, everything, it's all just chemicals in the brain. You know, it's... Uh, uh, they're all generated, they say, you know, by neurons in different areas in the brain, you know, and you know the the visual impressions they think are are uh, carried out in one portion of the brain, and sound is carried out in another, smell in another part of the brain. Uh, taste in another part of the brain, touch in another part of the brain, and even it's broken down even more than that. Motion is in one part of the brain, color is in one part of the brain. You know, like it's how all these things come together. You know, like right now I'm sitting in a room, I'm seeing colors, I'm hearing the sounds that you're speaking and I'm speaking. Uh, there's the, the smells, the taste. You know, I, I, you know, I just had lunch. I remember the taste of the thing. It all comes together. It all comes together in one seamless, uh, practically uh, instantaneous way. And they have no idea how that happens. So, I mean, what to speak of impressions from other living things. But I think a lot of our technologies are our way of trying to duplicate natural abilities that we have as conscious beings and perhaps once we're able to manifest. Right. It's so fast. Sometimes, and I don't know how to separate Michaels now because now we have two Michaels, but... Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to our ho- uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to talk to our host for a second. And one of the things that has always impressed about every lecture I've seen, whether it's about forbidden archaeology or anything that you've ever talked about, I wanted to point out that it has. I have sat reading forbidden archaeology and looking at knowledge filtration and looking at um, the subjects of morphology, or like we just talked about Peking Man, and 
when you wrote about how they were busting up fossils, uh, skeletons, in order to get more money, because if they brought in a fossil to an archaeologist, and I have heard Michael lecture about this with such calm and steady voice. Where I'm going with this is, I, I've, I, one of the questions I've always wanted to ask you was, how do you handle it so calmly when the, what we're finding in the ground and when you see these activities amongst paleoanthropologists and archaeologists Geologists and these connections of our consciousness and they, because whole brains have been cut out of people where they have nothing almost but the stem left and all these experiences you just discussed still happen within that human and when we look at these uh, finds and you've pointed out quite calmly that people are just looking at a bone and saying well this is our ancestor and discounting I guess there's two parts. It's you've been able to like calmly just talk through how they've just looked at a bone and said, well, this bone is our ancestor. And there seems to be a disconnect to that consciousness aspect because as we look back at these finds, not just evidence of eoliths and small parts, but the giant megalithic, not the size, but the complexities of everything we're finding within our genes and the physical items that we're finding megalithically all the way to India and China and wherever, they all seem to point to a much more intentional consciousness. And on one hand, I'm super impressed that you're able to do it without pulling your hair out. On the other hand, I've sat reading your work going, how do they get away with it? And so half commentary and question is, from a consciousness standpoint, isn't it really necessary for every archaeologist and every paleoanthropologist to consider that irrelevant to the lineal progression that they want to establish for a timeline for human existence, wouldn't it be more effective or is it happening with some researchers that consciousness, intelligent design, and the structures and the complexity of the things we're finding point to a more interconnected human existence? Here's a couple things on that. First, let's talk about the, you asked about the archaeologists. How, how are they handling this? And <clears throat> what I've noticed is basically the archaeologists, they're not monolithic. You know, there are different kinds of archaeologists with different commitments. And basically, I find they divide into two groups. One I call the archaeology group, singular, and the other, the archaeologies group, plural. And those in the first group, the archaeology group, they tend to think there is one science of archaeology. It's based on matter. It's physicalist. It's universal. We've understood everything. And we're not going to allow any other view. We're, we're all machines made of matter. We've come about, we understand the basic timeline, everything, and we're not going to hear anything else. That's one group. The archaeologies group is a little bit different. They understand, or they say they understand, that modern, western, reductionist, materialist science is one kind of understanding of archaeology. But there may be other archaeologies that are based on a different ontology, uh, a different, you know, the, the idea that, yeah, consciousness may be there. Yeah, in other words, there may be an Australian Aboriginal archaeology or a Native American Indian 
archaeology or a Pacific Islander archaeology that is based on different principles, different understandings than modern, western, so-called scientific archaeology, which was basically used to suppress other worldviews during the colonial period. So this archaeologies in the plural group is uh, uh, committed to multivocality understanding that there may be other archaeologies based on other principles. And I think that's a good thing. They encourage what they would call indigenous archaeologies. They would encourage you know, Native American Indians or Australian Aboriginals or other people, people with different worldviews to enter archaeology, not just to become part of the Western, materialist, mainstream, reductionist sort of archaeology, but to provide a genuine alternative archaeology. So I think that's a very healthy thing. Uh, actually, the Journal of the World Archaeological Congress, which is favorable to these ideas, is called archaeologies uh, in, in the uh, plural. So it's because of people like that that I've been able to get a hearing in professional archaeological circles. I've been able to present papers about these things at meetings of the World Archaeological Congress, the European Association of Archaeologists, and others. So there are some hopeful signs there, but this first group is very powerful and influential still, and as I said, they tend not to like the other approach that I've described. Does it, does it, uh, I know this sounds redundant, or but doesn't it frustrate you that they're willing to, again, it, you've already said it, to quote you, it's they, if the theories, if the facts don't fit the theories, throw out the facts, but is there, how do they look at you deadpan and say it? Uh, of course they have. Uh, but um, here's here's how I approach that. That was the, the second thing I wanted to address. You were asking how on an emotional level or consciousness level I, I deal with these things. And I would say, I mean, these are very, very deep questions. But I would say when I look at myself, at my, what I would call my, core interests or core values that I've had ever since I can remember when I was two years old or even younger. I've always been interested in truth. What is the real situation? Where am I? You know, if, if I was in my crib, you know, two years old, you know, I was wondering, is, is this it? Is this little space that I'm in, is that my truth? You know, I, I, always interested in the truth. What is the truth? What is real? And I've always been interested in justice, being treated fairly, and I've always been interested in relationship or love. And you know, so those are kind of my core values. And this idea of truth and justice, I think it's based on the idea that Oh, another value I would say that I've always been attentive to is expression. 
the ability to express myself to others. Now that that includes for me and the idea of fairness that one should be able to speak one's truth and one should be able to make up one's own mind about things. And I extend that to others as well. That I think if I say something and I'm given a chance to explain to someone what I think, that if they decide, very interesting, but that's not for me, I'm not persuaded, I'm not convinced, then fine, I accept that. <clears throat> uh, you know, so that, that, that's also one of my values. I don't think people have a right to use government to impose their will or beliefs on everybody, you know, without exception. You know, this idea of coerced belief is not something I personally favor. In that sense, you could say I'm a kind of anarchist <laughs> in a way. Not the kind that's being referred to in, in the media today, but uh, a, on a personal, individual level, I, I don't think I have the right or anybody has the right to compel uh, their belief system on someone else yeah so that, that's just so maybe you know because mistakenly or not because i have these kinds of convictions that i think if somebody is exposed to the truth and they're allowed to or they allow themselves to be persuaded by it then I think that's a good thing and maybe that's why I'm of course it could just be maybe I'm born under a particular star and therefore my personality and nature is this way whereas somebody born under a different star is going to behave in a, a different way. I respect that as well. Do you think systematically there is a, from what you're seeing as far as the antiquity of man and what can we do? You know, if there's something 50 million years ago, it's it's a rare thing to become a fossil. It's a rare thing to survive, uh, you know, being petrified. It's, it's the exception, not the rule. We don't have a complete fossil record, but in these megalithic structures in the things that we're finding that we don't know what the siding was. I have a background in construction and in looking at this, if they've been around as long as they have, are you seeing besides the evidence of, for those who aren't familiar, there is cymatic polygonal earthquake canceling constructions that seem to be of a singular time frame all around the world, but of the level of, ancient humans despite the written histories uh, physically from what you've seen all over the world do you feel like there's it maybe maybe it is one single culture but more importantly are you seeing something pointing to that more conscious uh in, engaged uh, i don't want to say uh you know they all knew how not to deal with greenhouse gases but are, are you seeing any newer research on that connected worldwide culture and possibly any sites that we haven't quite looked at. There's always the Eolus and the Neolus and the, I'm not talking about the, the rock bangers. I'm talking about maybe the simultaneous uh, high tech 
megalithic group? Um, I, I haven't personally myself looked into that specific question. There's nothing in my understandings and beliefs that would oppose that, that view that you're expressing. You know, I have seen some signs of it, but uh, you know, th this reminds me of something called the Silurian hypothesis. So the Silurian is a geological period that goes back hundreds of millions of years. Uh, it, during the Silurian period, according to the standard understanding, there were just some very primitive reptiles and amphibians. This is before the age of the dinosaurs, even. So uh, there were, you know, there was a, a television series in the U UK and England called uh, Dr. No. And one of the episodes of this science fiction kind of uh, series, the uh, you know there was uh, some disturbance, you know some earthquakes or something happening around the uh, some nuclear power plants, and the scientists were wondering what is it, and so they went down and looked, and they found deep in the layers of the earth, some reptile-like beings that had developed an advanced civilization from the time of the Silurian millions and millions of years ago. So there are some uh, scientists today that are doing environmental research. One of them was... Uh, Gavin Schmidt, who worked for NASA, and uh, there was an astrophysicist uh, named Adam Frank, and they were doing research about uh, the effects, uh, detecting, you know, there are, our galaxy is huge, you know, there are lots of Earth-like planets in different parts of the galaxy, and maybe in other galaxies as well. And they thought, okay, we're having global greenhouse warming on our planet, and there's a signature for that. You know, the presence of different uh, gases and metals in the uh, atmosphere. And there's also a, a signature in, in terms of different kinds of metallic compounds in the ocean water and the land and, and so on. So they were thinking, okay, if we look at other planets, you know, because they've been able uh, in recent years to detect planets in orbits around stars in distant parts of our galaxy. And they say, okay, is it possible to look at the light that's coming to us from those planetary systems and these and the different parts of the galaxy, uh, whether or not they have the signature of this kind of uh, artificial warming? of their atmospheres beyond that which would be produced normally, we could say, well, that's a signature of human-like intelligent populations elsewhere in the universe. But then they got the idea, and this is one of the few times in, that I've seen in modern science any particular interest in extreme human antiquity. They, have, they had, they expressed the idea in a scientific publication, uh, the International Journal of Astrobiology. They suggested, well, what about our Earth? Maybe 
billions or hundreds of millions of years ago, there was another civilization like ours that may have uh, created a previous episode of global warming and environmental pollution. And they must have been very advanced technologically to do that. So they were asking the question, well, what signs of that civilization that existed hundreds of millions of years ago would we be able to detect? And they said, well, like you were mentioning, the fossil evidence would degrade by that time. It just gets worn away by erosion, plate tectonics, and all that stuff. Uh, so that kind of signal or evidence might not be very prominent. But you know, if we looked in the soils and rocks and whatever's left for the radiometric signature of uh, specific compounds that cause you know, environmental destruction on the level of the kind we're doing today, that would be one way to do it. But at the present moment, nobody's searching for that evidence. So I think you've outlined uh, in what you've said, Jared, a possible new area of research. And I've seen, I've just uh, stated here that yeah, this is kind of an, an anomaly as far as I'm concerned, but there are mainstream scientists today, a few of them, who have just kind of out of the blue expressed an interest in this whole topic. Yeah, maybe there, were, there was some advanced worldwide human civilization that existed hundreds of millions of years ago. It was technologically advanced. Let's look for it. Let's look for the signal of it. I think that is a fantastic idea. Yeah, I found that uh, it's it's not as interesting, but I I've had the same curious like what what's the truth? What I just had this nonstop urge to figure out this. There, it always bugged me that everything was a temple, everything was for a fertility goddess, and no, apparently people had a lot more time in the past in between skinning deer to worship all the time. And when you have, when I found out about Terra Preta, engineered soil in South America, in Brazil, and they said, well, you know, what's interesting is that it's 20 feet deep, it's in, it's in Africa, though the same identical... And this is not a bunch of dinosaurs died and it was three parts compost and two parts carrots and, oh, uh, this one forest burned down. But the identical engineered soil, which is not sexy, is in Australia, it's in, mm. it's in Africa, it's in South America. And mm. it's like, time out, if we only have uh, nomadic peoples, why do we have 20, 30 feet of engineered soil that is... Uh, accordingly, we can't remake it. We don't know how to make it. Scientists, and I've talked to some soil scientists, they've looked at it for 100 years, and they're like, well, it's the best growing soil. It has the most nutrients. It's almost self-sustaining. It can, it can filter, to your point, uh, carbon dioxide. So it's meant to filter the air from possibly too high of a carbon footprint, but it also happens to filter fertilizer, and it happens to be also called chernozems in Canada, America, and in, Sir, in Siberia to Eastern Europe. And so mm -hmm. it's not as interesting to maybe, I think the future might be nanoarchaeology because those remnants of an engineered soil, it's not as simple as picking up and deciding, I mean, uh, an eolith or is it a rock that banged around? Yeah. I, I Could I ask how old you think those soils are oh it's very frustrating the the actual i i always like to back it up scientific papers from what i've been able to read is six thousand years is the only testing i'd be able to find but they're in layers that are in areas that should have had no human occupation 
at all. So even if you're, uh, and I, I defer to most of everything you've ever said and lectured about the, the accuracy of carbon dating of any kind. So if they're dating some of these soils to 6,000 years in middle Europe, like uh, the Ukraine area to South America, the problem is, is that, well, we got these indicators of like Waylaco to tie it all back to the beginning. And simultaneously we have tribes. What do we do with soil that may or may not be much older and might be recycled or readapted to another society or a society that moved into a pre-existing space. So we just don't have beyond the 6,000 year date. I don't have another date. Okay. But, just curious. Just curious. Um, I was going to add that I, I kind of touched on this topic of these kinds of, you could say micro signals or micro evidence uh, in connection with the California gold mine discoveries. Tabletop? Was, yeah, Table Mountain. Table Mountain. Uh, yeah, the Table Mountain discoveries where you had miners finding human bones and human artifacts, you know, st uh, stone mortars and pestles, obsidian spear points, and things like that in formations about 50 million years old. And, you know, sometimes people would ask me, okay, so 50 million years ago, people had stone tools and stone weapons. Is there any evidence for advanced technologies like you know, computers, cell phones, things like that. My answer was to that kind of question, well, see, the thing about stone tools is that they survive for millions and millions of years. Our advanced technologies they don't last very long in in the geological record. You know, there have been studies that have been done by scientists looking into environmental uh, issues. You know, you know, because our our modern worldwide technological civilization has had uh, an immense destructive effect on the environment. And sometimes environmental scientists wonder, well, how long would it take nature to recover if humans just disappeared from the planet tonight? You know, how long would it take to recover? And what would happen to the remains of our technological civilization? And they've kind of explained that after you know, a couple, you know, like just a very few thousand years, 10 or 20,000 years, there'd hardly be anything left that was recognizable you know, because metals will oxidize, plastics will, for the most part, degrade, and like that so everything will just kind of everything that's you know the ingredients say like of a a laptop computer would degrade except for some chemical traces of compounds that don't naturally occur in nature so like if 50 million years ago, there were people using stone tools and laptops, you know, in California, then the stone tools would probably survive all the way to the present, but the laptop wouldn't, except for those chemical traces of these compounds, mineral 
metals that don't occur naturally in 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 those quantities that would still could still possibly be detected even millions of years later but nobody's looking for those yeah you only you pointed traits. that out yeah people traits. only traits. find traits. what they're looking for yeah yeah let me yeah. let me break in for a second here isn't that what oil is isn't oil just remnants of of, of oil? there's a de- there's a debate about that i mean that gets you into forbidden geology Oh yeah, be an interesting topic for somebody to get into. There are some people. There are some scientists. The majority would say oil is the result of you know if you have plant remains under high pressure and heat, they'll form hydrocarbons that turn into oil. Others will say, uh uh-uh. uh that doesn't happen. Yeah, you know, this oil is some something else. So th- that that takes you. In, I haven't really deeply looked into it. It's just something that I am aware of. That the origin of oil uh, is a matter of debate among some geologists. Have either of you heard about that? Yes, yeah, the same thing is that the chemical and the the of what you can tell there seems to be the origin of oil itself is not remotely determined and it's unsettling. It's like it's also like engineered soil. The issue is where did it come from because it does not appear to actually be a biological agent yet uh, you have bacteria in the ocean dealing with hundreds of millions of gallons of it. It seems to continuously leak from some origin, some place in the earth, and it continually is reprocessed, at least oceanically, if that's a word. And then you have this actual chemical compound, and there is no proof that it was animals or or uh, remnants of plants over pressure over a geological period. There's no evidence of it at all. All right. And on that note, guys, uh, we're an hour in, so we're going to go ahead and just take a break here. We'll be right back with Jared Murphy and Michael Cremo right after this. And welcome back to Conflict Radio. We're with Michael Cremo and Jared Murphy. Michael, uh, in the last segment, we talked a little bit about consciousness. I'm curious, do you think that the ancients of the Earth experience consciousness different than we do? Uh, yes, I, I, I think they did. And, I mean, the basic difference between the way people in these traditional cultures looked at consciousness and the way that people in our modern society, influenced by you know, the ideas that are promoted by modern science, think about these things, is... In the modern education system, we're taught that consciousness is produced by brain chemistry. And, you know, when at the time of death, the chemicals stop interacting in the brain, no more consciousness. Everything is matter-based pretty strictly in modern science, and therefore in the education system and therefore in the minds of many people today, not all, but many. So in these traditional cultures like the Vedic culture of ancient India, which I know quite a bit about because I'm a practitioner of a system of yoga called bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion. I've looked into this quite a bit. So the people in these traditional cultures saw consciousness as something that was independent of matter. It wasn't produced by matter, but it could become covered by matter and those coverings are what we call 
bodies. Yeah, there are human bodies, there are plant bodies, there are animal bodies, and they're all vehicles for conscious selves. And in, in that way, we can see, well, consciousness would be a symptom of the real self. In religious terminology, some people would call it a soul. I... I personally use conscious self because if I say to some people soul, the thing, oh, that's religious and that requires belief and I'm not a believer, so I just want to know about things that actually exist that I don't have to believe in. So their minds kind of turn off. But if I say conscious self, who can deny that? It's the most real part of our existence, any of us. Without consciousness, you, I wouldn't be hearing what I'm speaking. You wouldn't be hearing. None of your listeners would be hearing. It's the most real fact of existence that we are conscious. We are individual. We are personal. I have my consciousness, you have your consciousness. It's, it's just the most real fact of our existence, and, and therefore we can talk about it on, on that basis, not as some belief system or, or, or whatever. So every type of body is a vehicle for a conscious self. And in the human vehicle, consciousness can most fully and completely express itself. And I would say they, they had, many of them, the, the understanding and awareness of that. Whereas many people in today's society really don't have that understanding that as a conscious individual personal self there's something different than the body made of molecules that they happen to occupy at some particular point in time do you feel like there's anything currently that's not turned to dust like you said over a billion years or a hundred million years or 50 million years do you feel like there is anything in our actual archaeological physical record that would that is pointing to that higher conscious society well yes I I do think there is something that points in that direction because modern science would say in the beginning there's no consciousness they're just chemicals in the ocean and somehow they would say those chemicals combine together to produce some first self-reproducing organism, some single-celled organism. And somehow or other, some of those single-celled organisms started sticking together uh, to form multicellular organisms. And again, they would say no consciousness, just chemicals interacting with each other. And, and then they would say some of those uh, multicellular creatures started reproducing, and as they reproduced, there, there was changes in their DNA, which is a molecule connected with reproduction and heredity from one generation to the next. And as there were accidental changes in the DNA, there were accidental changes in the structure of 
these multicellular creatures and the ones that survived in the particular environments they reproduced and the process went on and on till you get some simple animals in the ocean that eventually go on to the land that develop into amphibians and then reptiles and then mammals and then primates and then hominins by hominin it means immediate human ancestor like Australopithecus, some kind of ape man that gradually develops consciousness and awareness and very, very late in the process. So the archaeological evidence that I document in Forbidden Archaeology shows that Humans, like us, conscious, intelligent human beings, have existed for hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, going all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. So this means, what this evidence means is we need a new explanation for human origins. And I, I would propose... Now, before we even ask the question, where did human beings come from, we should first ask the question, what is a human being? And most scientists today will just say we're a machine made of molecules, and that's it. But I would say, no, this phenomenon of consciousness, nobody has shown how you can get consciousness from chemicals. There's plenty of evidence that shows that consciousness can exist apart from matter, apart from the brain, apart from the physical body. It's something that has its own independent existence. So I would say that's what the archaeological evidence shows. And if we're talking about evidence that's physical but not necessarily restricted to the kind of archaeological evidence you can find in textbooks there are temples in India in which there are sacred images of gods and goddesses that according to the local traditions are from other parts of the universe and that have been worshipped by humans on this planet for hundreds of millions of years. But that's a different kind of physical evidence. Those sacred images are still in these ancient temples in India and can be seen even, even today. And when you see them and are in the presence of them, you can feel effects on your consciousness that demonstrate, in a, if you've ever experienced it, demonstrate in a very convincing way that Yes, there's been a civilization that has been based on an understanding that we exist in a consciousness-based universe, not a matter-based system of reality. Is that kind of, you know, you talk about in Forbidden Archaeology, the ages, is it the Kaaba and the Putjangan formations? Uh, those are formations in Java that go back about 
to a, a million years ago, I believe. Yeah, I think you have down like 1.9 million years, give or yeah. take. But that was yeah. you. You were, uh, and I wanted to ask you two parts on this. One is, you you are always very. I've loved that you've been very critical about, uh, not critical. You've just been very observant about the dating meth methods. And at the time when you wrote it, and I'm quoting from at least my copy. I'm just looking at the section. It's potassium argon dating so in that at the time you know you're, you're you were quoting jacobs and curtis in 71 and 72 and they were giving it a 1.9 million year and i guess two parts to it one is about the formation and the other part is about the dating now and then do any scientists like once the house of cards even has one hole in it how do you excuse the the consciousness and this this the, the actual consciousness and the connection to these outer worldly places it it's it seems like you have to acknowledge the actual science uh, here's here's how I approach that whole question um, for myself I have my own way of understanding these things but if I am trying to communicate an idea to somebody who has gone through the university scientific education process then either as a professional academic or scientist or as you know, an intelligent person who's got some other area of specialization but still has been exposed to that kind of idea you have to have some kind of framework for the discussion so what I've chosen to do is to say to the scientific community according to methods that you consider reliable like potassium argon dating or this or that other kind of dating this formation is so and so many millions of years old so how do you explain the presence in those layers of this human bone or that human artifact or that human footprint how do you explain it <clears throat> so either they have to say well actually all our dating methods are very unreliable and are subject to all kinds of conditions and factors and Therefore, that formation really isn't that old. In other words, they have to admit that their dating methods are completely unreliable. Or they have to say, well, <clears throat> uh, that human artifact or human footprint or human bone doesn't really belong in that formation. And then it's up to them to try to show exactly how it could have arrived in that position. If they want to say, well, we know it had to arrive because according to our theories, humans didn't exist at that time. That's not very convincing in any scientific way. You know, it, you know, because then they just have to speculate. Well, and how, well, it could have been that the original discoverer made a mistake. It could have been that it slipped down through some fissure. It could have been. A lot of burials. A lot of people digging burials. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people digging burials that, that leave no trace of it having been a burial. You know, it, it's like, it, that's not scientific either. So, you know, I've kind of, you know, so that's how I have dealt with that particular issue because 
some there are some uh, for example there are biblical creationists who accept a very young age for the earth of 10,000 years or less and I think they have a perfect right to do that and they've provided one of the areas of research they engage in is calling into question the different scientific dating methods that give ages for geological formations that are older than 10,000 years or so. So, uh, uh, which I think they have, if, if that's the approach that they want to take, I'm fine with that. Kind of get along with them. We, you know, I've been invited to speak at lectures and I've been on interviews with people of that conviction. And we tend to agree that whatever the case is, human beings like us have been around since the beginning. We didn't evolve from primitive apes and monkeys. We would just disagree about the age of the earth. You know, so that's kind of how I deal with these questions. Uh, from my own personal commitments to Vedic teachings, I'm kind of prepared to accept an age for the earth in the low billions of years. So I admit that's my personal bias and people can take that into account you know, when they're listening to me. And yeah, I think as long as everybody just kind of puts their cards on the table and you know, then we can have a discussion about these things and everybody can come to their own conclusions. Do you think that there is a point then? Like I brought up the ages of those two formations in India because one of your points was that… They were that, in Indonesia, by the way. Uh, yeah, and the issue was that it invalidates – you pointed out that it invalidates the out-of-Africa theory. So – and I get this question, too, where it's, uh, hey, you know, where do you think? And it's like, well, that's not even the question at this point. The issue is if we've been here for maybe in the low billions, do you point to – is it is it an erroneous question, even if it isn't, based on – irrelevant to bias, but based on your knowledge base from this Vedic literature – do you feel that there is either an origin or a more accurate depiction of not so much out of Africa, but of is it is it even a question we can table that we know where we're from or just that we've been here? Uh, uh, up to this point, what I've really focused on has just been the idea that we've been here for a lot longer than modern science now allows. And then I think there's some conclusions that can be drawn from that. And I would say, you know, it, it depends upon how, I mean, I'm going to use the term, how we use our epistemology. So epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with how do we know things? How do we know what is true? What is evidence? What isn't evidence? So uh, we there are different kinds of evidence for a spiritual person. For a spiritual person like me, one kind of evidence is the statements from the Vedas, the Vedic histories, the Puranas. That's one kind of evidence. But if I'm speaking to an audience of archaeologists or university students or just even a group of ordinary people in 
the United States or Mexico or Germany or England or Japan. Uh, they're to them, most of them, ninety nine percent of them, a statement from the Vedas isn't going to be taken as evidence. They want to know well, what does science have to say about this. So if we kind of confine ourselves to that evidence, archaeological evidence, dating methods, geology, and all of that, well, there are some things I can say. I wrote a 900-page book based on, you know, forbidden archaeology based on that kind of evidence. But I made kind of a limited claim and kind of, when I've given lectures either at scientific conferences or universities or to general to the general public in different parts of the world, when that question comes up, the one that you raised, but uh, beyond, you know, humans have been around for a long time, can we say something about the place of human human origins where they first appeared, my, my honest answer to that has been, well, that is a topic for further research. More of a search and recovery? Well, I think there are different, there's genetic evidence. You know, some people have used uh, mitochondrial DNA variation in mitochondrial DNA or the X chromosome or the Y chromosome, you know, they have a method whereby they think they can determine where the oldest uh, DNA samples come from. You know, they look at the variation in the DNA among living human, the living human population, and they think that by... Yeah, the the area where you have the most genetic diversity is the most recent, and where you have the less genetic diversity in a certain area of the mitochondrial DNA, the DNA in the X chromosome, or the DNA in the Y chromosome, uh, they think that the area where you have the least diversity is the original area. Of course, there are a lot of flaws in that, but that's the basic idea. And on that basis, many scientists have concluded that South Africa, Southern Africa, is the original homeland of the human species. But I was looking over some other studies that gave different geographical locations. So, uh, in, in my personal work up to this point, I really haven't focused on that particular question, but if I did, it would kind of take me into that whole area of looking at what modern science today uses as evidence to support its claim that uh, the first appearance of anatomically modern humans was in Africa and that everything came out of Africa. I think uh, you've thoroughly destroyed that <laughs> for biology. Well, I, you know, I think actually the oldest piece of evidence in forbidden archaeology does come from South Africa. <clears throat> Of the actual oldest piece of evidence that I cited. It was a very extreme anomaly. It was some grooved hematite spheres that come from uh, South Clark's Africa. Yeah. yeah, the Clerksdorp spheres. Yeah, so... Well, I spent, what, what I spent a month that? down there for that. Yes, I, I got to see them. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, I was, I was there for a month. Um, I was invited. But yeah, to your, to your point, though, it's of that evidence, do you feel like there's a point where, based on the literature and the findings, do you feel like there's a mystification then possibly blurring the lines of some of the actual 
of those spheres, for instance, do you feel that between the literature or the Vedic histories, do you feel like there's a, a blurring of that mystifying of what maybe might be that consciousness and science that is from a humanity that is way beyond, like, again, we're in safe mode, maybe. I describe yeah. it as safe mode. No, I, I would say uh, that case was included in an appendix to forbidden archaeology. And uh, the introduction to that appendix says in the main body of the book, yeah, we've considered for the most part cases that are very well documented in the professional scientific literature, you know, the primary scientific literature. In other words, original reports by archaeologists, geologists, other scientists digging into the earth, published in the professional scientific literature. The yeah. Clerkstorp sphere we put in an appendix of you, cases that aren't so well documented according to the scientific standard, but are nevertheless interesting and worthy of consideration for the sake of completeness. And you know, we've kind of included these extreme anomalies in this appendix to the, uh, to the book. So... I think what 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 our conclusion about that particular case was kind of like in the absence of any really ironclad naturalistic explanation for their I mean not just some speculation well somehow or other they had to have been formed naturally but I mean some real in the absence of any real detailed explanation of how they form naturally, we had to keep our minds open to the possibility that they're involved with uh, consciousness and things like that. I mean, that, the, that there's some intelligent source for them. Now, there are things that go beyond that even. Uh, because Older than that? no. I'm talking about in terms of the kinds of explanations that are given for them. Sure. Uh, it was mentioned in some of the reports which were published in what we might call tabloid literature. You know, not scientific reports, but there were reports in the tabloid literature that these things would uh, that that they would uh, rotate spontaneously in their display cases, and then also when Forbidden Archaeology was published, a television producer from Holland, the Netherlands, got in touch with me and said, "I'd I'd like to film." those artifact that artifact you know because we had a picture of one of the Clerkstorp spheres in forbidden archaeology so we put him in touch with the director of the museum of natural history in Clerkstorp where that specimen was kept and the uh, museum director told us the object had been stolen from the museum sure. by, by a person he characterized as being a, quote, white witch. Okay. Indicating it had some kind of mystic or otherworldly significance. So I hope somebody's put it to good use. <laughs> How old would you date those spheres from what you saw or from what uh, you learned about them? 
Well, from what I learned about them is pretty much what I stated. They're found in a mineral deposit that's over 2 billion years old. I think 2.8 billion years old. And that, unless somebody could show that they artificially you know, came down from some higher level into those deposits that should be their age. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, when that's, I that's not even wrote their age. That's just how long I didn't, I didn't uh, have anything other than published literature to go on. But I later went to South Africa and I met the chief mining engineer from the mine where they come from. And he showed me a, a block of mineral from the mine, a block, solid block of these mineral deposits with these spheres and the parallel grooves just embedded in the solid rock. So... But go ahead. I'm sorry. No, uh, when you said well, well, when you said spheres, one of the things some people might not be familiar with them, but they had, they have ge they have geometric. They have basically two or three or four lines. They're slightly different sizes, but they are almost like ancient golf balls. They have a fibrous interior. They have a solid surface that is. They were messing up the. Uh, when you said you met the engineer. They were actually messing up the blades that they were using to cut these blocks out, correct? Yeah. Yeah, because they're so strong. So these are objects that not only would have had to randomly somehow use separate ingredients to create these spheres that ended up with perfect lines on them, uh, manufactured. They look like manufactured well, there's no other way to describe them. They look like manufactured spheres for a tabletop game or pool or or uh, I always think of the bumper pool. I don't know why. I always think of the bumper pool balls. Uh -huh. And and they're found in solid they were they were mining out this stone and they have found them over and over and over and they were so strongly made that despite blades that could cut the stone they were in they were dulling and breaking the blades yeah yep i've heard things like that of course they're if you actually go to the mine some of them i mean i have to confess that what i saw personally were perhaps what we might call a selection of the best, the best of them, because some of them are not perfect spheres. You know, they're kind of flattened or squashed or something. You know, that's that that apparently is also true. So uh, yeah, it's more of the lines, though. Geometrically speaking, it would be really are, hard. To those Justified are the things, those. right? Yeah. Those are the things that I found real. The ones with the grooves on them, right? It, it, they're too geometrically. They're they're perfect, and it's more of nature doesn't randomly repeat over and over and over, hundreds and thousands of times. The and again, they're in solid. They're in what may have been a a sand or a mud. But they're now in a solid stone, so over a very slow process, over 2 billion years, they could easily be slowly crushed, right? Yeah, the ones that I saw in the block of mineral that was shown to me by the engineer from the mine, uh, there were, they were kind of halfway protruding from the solid rock. And they had the grooves on them that went around the exposed part and then back into the solid rock, you know, like, so to me, there was no doubt that those things were embedded in that mineral deposit, which now is a solid rock-like form. Yeah, so 
pretty amazing. Yeah, I saw them in person. I was in uh, Vaterval Boven, and I got to see them, and I couldn't help but think that it may have been like a giant golf ball driving range, and they all just ended up in the same pit. And yeah, how big are they? Up. One or two inches in diameter, I would say, the ones yeah, I've could, seen. Yeah, did you take it? Uh, obviously, it took some pictures, but uh, they're – Hard to get a proportion unless you have like a ruler down, but they're not very big. But there was any research currently that mining engineer, are they continuing to run into those spheres? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. When I saw the mining engineer, it was on a lecture tour I was doing in South Africa, and that was over 10 years ago. And, you know, so what's actually going on currently with the mine, it's it's called the Wonderstone Mine near Otostal in the western Transvaal region of South Africa. I, I, I don't know about the – any – anything that's going on there currently regarding these things. Have there been any updates as far as you're, you're concerned? On, uh, historically speaking, there's a list of finds from England to uh, the Red Crag to Table Mountain. Is there anything that's new to you that you've seen that has piqued your curiosity for antiquity of anatomically correct humans? Uh, yeah, I... I mean, the way this knowledge filtering process operated was kind of like this. You know, Darwin in the mid-19th century, 1859, published Origin of Species. Then European scientists went out looking for missing links, connecting modern humans with ancient apes. In other words, they were looking for missing links, eight men of different kinds. And they weren't finding them. They were finding evidence that humans like us were existing up to 20 million years ago, 50 million years ago. And then in 1890, they finally found their missing link, Java Man. And that was about a million years old. And then they had to decide, well, now what are we going to do with all this other evidence that we – now we have our missing link at less than a million years ago, so humans can't go back any further than you know, a million years. Uh, what are we going to do with all this evidence that's accumulated up to this time that humans were existing way before that? Okay, so they got rid of it. They filtered it out. They just didn't mention it anymore. And then from that time, the early 20th century, whenever archaeologists would find something that was that showed anatomically modern humans were around longer than they should be, they would just explain it away, set it aside. So over the past couple of years, there have been some discoveries that show exactly that. Like in 2016, some archaeologists were doing excavations at Ulduvai Gorge in Tanzania in East Africa. And they they were excavating a formation that is 1,800,000 years old. And they found in this excavation a finger bone. Actually, it's one of the finger bones in the, 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 the little finger of the, the left hand. Uh, so, I mean, this, this may seem like a very minor discovery but it illustrates an important point regarding huge. knowledge filtering so they carefully studied this uh, finger bone 
they call it the OH86, Ulduvai hominin 86, finger bone. And they carefully studied it. They measured it. Yeah, they did all the measurements on it, about 30 different measurements of, of it. And then they compared those measurements to the measurements of fing the same finger bone in all different kinds of ape and monkey species like chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, etc. And then they also compared it to the same finger bone that had been found in different species of hominins like Homo habilis and Australopithecus. And then they also compared it to anatomically mod the, the, you know, the anatomically modern human finger bone, same bone. And they found that the OH86 specimen fit squarely in the modern human group. In other words, it was different than the same finger bone of apes, monkeys, Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. And their conclusion, which they published in their scientific report, went something like this. Uh, the finger bone OH86 is closest to anatomically modern Homo sapiens. But the geological age of the formation in which it was found obviously precludes assigning it to Homo sapiens. It, to me, it's just, I mean, they're looking right at this. They're saying it's human. It's Homo sapiens. It's different from any ape man, different from any ape or monkey. It's Homo sapiens, exactly. But we can't call it Homo sapiens because Homo sapiens, according to our theories, didn't exist 1,800,000 years ago. So that is an example of a recent discovery that to me just screams out anatomically modern humans were existing almost two million years ago in Africa. It's the scientists are looking directly at it, but they can't see it for what it is because of their theoretical pre conceptions and maybe i've lost a little of my gravity here <laughs> no i think you're dead on because jack horner I, I mean you know jack horner the the dinosaur guy right yeah and his i love his lecture on uh where did all the baby dinosaurs go and he goes and he said it right in the interview he goes because i'm jack horner i can cut my dinosaurs open and and scientists love to name things. And what we found was they were naming species of dinosaurs that were really the teens. They were really the babies of a single species and that they did not look the same by the time they would form their hard heads or triceratops, etc. So mm -hmm. here we you if you don't if you rely strictly on morphology and I think you pointed out more than uh, uh, plenty of times that if you're strictly staring at something and not actually testing it and i understand that there's a degree you know like the degradation of a period of dna that it, we currently don't have a science to extract but if you're strictly staring at the skull like your hamlet in shakespeare you can say whatever you want but there's this tipping point isn't there where ultimately if they can extract extremely ancient dna like the paracas in peru that these kind of theories are ultimately going to collapse for the reality of what you just said? Yeah, I think ancient DNA is playing a, a bigger and bigger role. We'll, we'll have to see how, how, yeah, because, I mean, it's a very complex molecule and it does degrade. Yeah, they have recovered ancient DNA from some Neanderthal specimens and on that basis they've kind of concluded that we interbred with them because we 
have some of those, some of that in our cu current human populations. You know, they preserve some of that Neanderthal DNA. So, yeah, that's a new area of evidence. But what I expected to show is gradually scientists will accept that humans like us have been, been around for longer than they think possible. When I was doing the research for forbidden archaeology, their limit for anatomically modern humans was about 100,000 years. And then in the next decades, the you know, around 2000, by 2000, they, they got it up to about 200,000 years. And now in 2020, they've got it at around 300,000 years. So to me, it's all tiny steps in the right direction. And I think that's going to continue until the dam finally breaks. Do you think the consciousness side of it, the memory of our actual potentially deep buried memories in our consciousness and or just this, uh, again, if we're in safe mode, if we're operating at 10 or 14% consciousness of what was once maybe a very conscious mind, is those buried DNA references, are they manifesting again naturally? Are we headed to that consciousness are we rebooting? Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that you bring up this idea of consciousness as related somehow to the to the fossil evidence, and I I, I think there's truth to that. Yeah, you know, there's an actual kind of history of uh, what we might call psychic archaeology. And, you know, there there actually been a, a few cases where prominent scientists have have made made use of 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 that. So uh, <clears throat> Yeah, there was a case actually again from South Africa. You know, there were some discoveries that were made of Australopithecus at a place called Sterkfontein in in South Africa. And you know, one of the scientists that was involved in the discoveries of Australopithecus at Sterk, the Sterkfontein Caves in South Africa, he uh, he made use of a psychic. You know, he 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 was uh, he had been introduced to the Theosophical Society, and through this Theosophical Society, he met a a uh, psychic. So. <clears throat> Uh, you know, the scientist's name was J.T. Robinson, and the psychic's name was Jeffrey Hodson. So <clears throat> Robinson, you know, this, this happened in, you know, maybe the 1950s or 19, early 1960s. <clears throat> so Robinson took Hodson, this psychic, into the Sterkfontein caves. And he, the psychic lay down on the floor of the cave. And then <clears throat> Robinson would place fossils of Australopithecus on his forehead and on the forehead of the psychic, Jeffrey Hodson, who was lying down in this cave. And in his kind of psychic trance, Hodson would be able to see the whole creature as it existed millions of 
years ago and report, you know, oh, it's doing this, it's doing that. And I really found it quite amazing because J.T. Robinson is a very prominent figure in the history of uh, archaeology and paleoanthropology. He made a lot of important discoveries, but it's just you, you never hear you know, that he, he made use of a, a psychic like that in his research. And he said it, it contributed to his understanding of, you know, in a scientific way of what these creatures were, were doing. So uh, I reported on this in a paper that I presented at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress you know, that took place in 2012 in the country of Jordan. And <clears throat> Yeah, one of the archaeologists walked up to me afterwards and said, "That's really amazing. I never, I never knew that." And I said to him, "Well, that's why I'm here to tell you something you don't already know, <laughs> because mostly at these archaeology conferences, they're just reporting stuff that they already really know, you know." So. Yeah. You're, you're gonna... the super standout for the, uh, your your actually entertainment and actual information that they are falling asleep in their chair over. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have to uh, cut in here and and we've only got a, a few minutes left, guys. Michael, I want to ask you real quick. Do you do you believe in in alien UFOs? Do you think that they're we're being visited, or do you think it's possible that ancient civilizations are still alive somewhere on the planet or even underneath the planet inside like living in the hollow earth all of the above in, in other words I tend not to see these things in either or categories uh, I think there can be ancient human-like creatures, flesh and blood creatures like us that existed millions of years ago on this planet and other planets in this universe. I think simultaneously to that, there can also be extraterrestrial beings who are not of the strictly flesh and blood type of biology, but ha who have bodies made of more subtle material elements than we're familiar with, uh, different intellectual and mental energies. They can have bodies made of that kind of substance. I think there could be extraterrestrials that are completely non-material. So, to me, it's like all of the above. Yes, there were humans on this planet who were in contact with non-material extraterrestrial beings who visited or had some other way of communicating with or contacting us in the distant past. They, they could also have been in contact with extraterrestrial beings who were of basically you know, the same kind of flesh and blood biology. Uh, and as far as what's present on this planet, I don't think we know all the dimensions of even this planet. I don't think we have a complete catalog of all the different types of beings that exist and have existed on what we call our planet. And you know, so, so to me, it's kind of like all of the above. Because people, they tend to want a simple explanation of our past, whether it's a scientific explanation or a simple religious creation account or a simple extraterrestrial account. But the, the real truth may be a complex fabric 
interweaving all of these different elements. So again, my answer to your question is all of the above. All right. I think that's D. Yeah, and uh, and before before we uh, before we sign off, uh, Jared, do you have one more question to ask before we? Oh gosh, before we I, call it, if you have one more question, I would be more interested in because of your deep knowledge background, Michael. I would want to know after everything we've talked about where your mind is and where your thought process is about something you'd maybe want to share. Uh, to me, it's always very fascinating uh, when we get involved in these questions because in, in one sense, they may seem like questions for you know, a bunch of ivory tower scholars to discuss, but ultimately it comes down to what all of us are always concerned about. What is our real identity? Who are we really? Are, are we going to let others define our identity and in that way kind of control us? Or are we going to understand ourselves what our identity really is? So I think that's a, a very important issue is at the root of every problem that we're confronting in the world today. And I would say, you know, my message would be to anyone who's listening would be, let's define our identity as beings of pure consciousness and not as machines made of matter, machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival. We're all beings of pure consciousness. That is my, <clears throat> what I've been thinking about. That's kind of like if you were to distill everything that's there and Forbidden Archaeology and the other books I've written, that would be the most essential message. Because if we understood that, we wouldn't be dividing ourselves up uh, into so many different groups on the basis of race, gender, nationality, class, or, or whatever. We wouldn't be complicit in the environmental destruction that's going on. We'd be finding a way to satisfy our material needs cooperatively in the most natural, efficient, fair, and equitable way possible while putting most of our human energy into developing that resource of consciousness which we all share. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a, um, it's an, I've, I, and this, you really did help me as I worked on my own book, what, looking at forbidden archaeology and listening to your lectures and listening to what you've had to say. I just want to add that it's a, I've, I've tried to describe it to people that our history and our past isn't just historical. It's not a search and recovery. It's a search and rescue because it applies to our present today and being conscious and connected again the way we once were, not in safe mode. I, Absolutely. I All right, guys. That's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, Jared, do you want to tell everybody where they can find you? Uh, yeah, it's not aliens worse. It's us discovering our lost history it is on Amazon. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel at not aliens, but it's not that there's not aliens. It's just that this is a book that covers consciousness to our history to that. What we, everything we've talked about and it's on Amazon. It's not aliens worse. It's us. All right. And, uh, Michael, you want to tell us where we can find all of your work? The best place to start is my personal website, mcremo.com, M-C-R-E-M-O.com. And we have a special offer going on now for 
anyone who purchases a copy of my latest book, My Science, My Religion, they will also be offered the opportunity, if they wish to take advantage of it, to receive a copy of Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the spiritual texts of ancient India that have influenced me in my thinking and writing over uh, the past few decades. And uh, I'm also present on Facebook, uh, Michael Cremo, it's really me, Twitter, Twitter also at Michael Cremo, and there are also some websites for my different books, ForbiddenArchaeology.com, for example, HumanDevolution.com, where I get into some of these consciousness-related questions. So those are some places where people can connect with me. All right, awesome. And uh, I want to thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Michael and, and Jared. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. All right, this is Conflict Radio. We'll be right back right after this. And welcome back to Conflict Radio. I guess that's going to about do it for us. That was pretty interesting. I like how we were able to talk a little bit about consciousness and what is going on with how we view things. And I find it particularly interesting how Michael brought up how there are beings of non-matter out there. I think that's something that we should explore perhaps in the future. Could he be talking about ghosts or or alien species that they're basically taking up no matter? I find that fascinating. So, we're just going to go ahead and wrap it up. This is Conflict Radio. Be sure to subscribe to the Conflict Radio Network on YouTube. Make sure you find us on Spreaker and iHeartRadio and Apple iTunes. We're in all those great places. Make sure you check out our guest website and their books. It's always neat. You need to go over and, and look at their stuff and, and tell them Conflict sent you. That's always a, a great plug for us when you do that. Helps us get more and more great guests. We'll be back on Thursday. We're going to be talking about Shakespeare. So until then, batten down the hatches and be safe.